Good Wednesday morning. This is May 1st, and it's also the first of what we hope to be many future podcasts by the Voices of Vermont. This is Sandy Baird. I'm Steve Goodkind, and we hope to make this a regular occurrence. We're trying to provide some kind of news and news analysis based on a Vermont perspective, and uh, we consider ourselves citizen journalism, not professional journalists, and probably most of the people you'll see appear here will not be professional journalists, but we'll give a Vermont perspective on local, which will mostly be Burlington, some Vermont, nation and sometimes international events. Each episode will have probably two, maybe three different components, different stories. And uh, with that, I think we'll try and get going. The format's going to be we'll show something, a news clip of some sort, which is a lead into the story, and then one of us will talk about that story. There may be some back and forth of questions, and then we'll do the same thing with our second story. And again, we hope to make this uh, bi-weekly, weekly, we're going to find out. But this is our first run, so it is a little bit of an experiment for us too, but we'll, we'll learn from it. And with that said, um, Sandy's going to do a story regarding the student encampments. Which I think if you read, you saw the video that preceded this, you read it in the news about this. It's a big thing now. Campuses all over the country are seeing protests over the events in Gaza. And there's even a protest in Burlington, our University and a, of Vermont. And an encampment. And an encampment. So we're going to talk about that. That's how we're going to bring the national event into local. And with that, I'm going to leave it to Sandy. New York police and riot gear raided the campuses of Columbia University and the City College of New York Tuesday night, arresting more than 200 student protesters in the latest crackdown on peaceful Palestine solidarity protests on U.S. campuses. Over the past two weeks, police in the United States have arrested more than 1,200 protesters on campuses as students set up encampments, calling on schools to divest from Israel. The raid on Columbia came less than 24 four hours after students occupied Hamilton Hall. It was 56 years to the day that police stormed the same hall during the historic 1968 protests at Columbia. On Tuesday night, police climbed into the barricaded building using a ladder attached to a police vehicle. During the police raid on the Columbia campus, the police also broke up the Gaza Solidarity Encampment, which had inspired similar encampments across the country. Columbia President Manu Shafiq asked the NYPD to, quote, retain a presence on campus through at least May 17, 2024. That's two days after Columbia's graduation. On Tuesday, faculty at Barnard College, which is part of Columbia, overwhelmingly passed a vote of no confidence confidence for President Laura Rosenberry. Meanwhile, in California, pro-Israeli counter-protesters armed with sticks and metal rods attacked a pro-Palestinian encampment on the campus of UCLA, shortly after UCLA's chancellor ruled the encampment unlawful. Pro-Israel counter-protesters launched fireworks at the encampment, which they tried to tear down. In Richmond, Virginia, police deployed pepper spray against student protesters at Virginia Commonwealth University. At least 13 arrests were reported. In Louisiana, a police SWAT team raided an encampment at Tulane University earlier this morning, arresting at least 14 students. The raid came hours after the school suspended five students and the school's chapter of students for a democratic society. In Missouri, a history professor was hospitalized Saturday after police violently threw him to the pavement. Steve Tamari, who teaches at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, was filming a protest at Washington University on his phone when he was attacked. His wife, Sandra Tamari, who is Palestinian-American, was arrested during the same protest. Meanwhile, at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, student protesters have voluntarily ended their encampment after school officials agreed to hold a vote on divesting from Israel.
On Tuesday, the United Nations criticized the police crackdown on student protests. This is Marta Hurtado, spokesperson for the U.N. Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. We are troubled by a series of heavy-handed steps taken to disperse and dismantle protests across university campuses in the United States of America. Freedom of expression and the right to peaceful assembly are fundamental to society, particularly when there is a sharp disagreement on major issues, as there are in relation to the conflict in the occupied Palestinian territory and Israel. Okay, to introduce myself, my name is Sandy Baird. I'm uh, an attorney in Burlington. I've been here ever since the fateful day of 1968, when the Chicago Democratic Convention kind of blew up with some of the same issues as we're facing today. I remained interested in uh, anti-war activity since that time, and now I'm hoping to be able to uh, talk about those events uh, that are occurring right under our noses at the University of Vermont, at Brown University, now at the small college, the Sterling College, up in the northeast, I guess, of Vermont, um, that there are student protests once again all over our state, all over the world, and all over our nation. And what are those protests about? The protests are essentially anti-war activities as they were in 1968. In 1968, we were opposing students. I was a student then at one of them, and Steve also, at one of the more radical colleges in the United States at the time, the University of Wisconsin, where I went to get my master's degree in history uh, between the years 1965 and I left in 1968. Eight. But those were the years where the University of uh, Wisconsin actually blew up. In fact, some of the anti-war activities led to the blowing up of a building, which was very unfortunate. Um, but anyway, so what is going on here is though the story of right now, the local story that sort of complements what's going on all over our country. But it did remind both of us of events when we were both it younger. It really in reminded the 60s. me of the 60s, totally, totally, especially because the center of the student protest in 68 was Columbia University as well, where friends of mine and friends of yours, Steve, actually were involved in the student protests in May of 1968 when, the, when once again our generation of students took over and occupied, what's it called, Hamilton Hall. I think it's Columbia. Columbia. That's what? the one they're occupied this time. I know. Okay, so that's what's been happening. But it's not only there that it's happening, it's happening all over the right. country and, in fact, all over the world. As my friend Wafiq Farah points out, these are protests, though, that are American-led, that are American-led, not led by Europeans or other kinds of nationality students. These are led by our students, our American students. So what is the nature of this? Should I, do you... Do you well, want to uh, I think you're going to tell us you were actually up at yes. the encampment. So give yes. us a sense what what you saw, yes. what you think of it, what you think others think of it. Okay, so um, because of my long-term interest in anti-war activities, and because actually I have always in court represented protesters, uh, always represented protesters who have opposed many of the U.S. wars, including in Central America, where I was one of the attorneys who represented students who were involved in the, in the occupation, really, of Senator Stafford's office over the wars in Central America. That was called the case of Winooski 44. But anyway, so yes, I went up to the encampments on Sunday. Um, and, and this is what I observed, if any, any did you, did you know that, Steve, that I did go up there well, to yeah, see? I don't First know what hand. you saw, but you tell me you went. Yeah. Now, this is, I was there for an eyewitness to what was going on. So I want to restrict myself, in a way, to what I saw. Uh, and then I will, if you want, or if our viewers would like, I would like to kind of analyze that we'll, as well. We'll probe into it, yeah. What? We'll probe into it a little bit. All right, sure. so um, I went there to... Um, the leader, one of the leaders of the organizations is a, a colleague of mine, a Palestinian man named Wafiq Fawar. He notified me that there was uh, going to be a surprise encampment, the installation of an encampment on the UVM campus. And that was, he told me that, I think, on s Saturday night. And what it happened? Before, it was happening at that happened. instant. 
And it was really, I think it must have taken people by surprise because there was no announcement of it. He announced it to me as it was happening. Um, and I, as far as I know, there had been no announcement. No, nobody knew about it. Anyway, so they weren't supposed to. Anyway, so the students took it over and put up their tents um, and began to occupy the space behind Royal Tyler Theater between the library and uh, Davis Center. And what I saw when I went up there was, in fact, that encampment. And they were protesting the war between Israel and Gaza. Um, anyway, and they were there encamped. Um, they were feeding themselves. People were bringing them water. And they were totally peaceful. And they were opposing something else that I think is even more important in a way. They were an anti-war group. They are opposed to the war between Israel and Gaza. However, they were also um, determined to um, do this peacefully and nonviolently. And of course, I'm assuming then you didn't see any signs of violence or disrespectful no. behavior. Exactly. Things are calm. Can you, can you see it from the road, by the way, if you drive by? No. In fact, it? unlike other encampments, remember there have been other encampments at the University of sure. Vermont, including the protest in the 80s and 90s against apartheid South Africa. Huge occupation then, uh, which led, all those occupations led to the downfall of the apartheid regime in South Africa. That was in, at Waterman. But this right is on the a, green. In, right on the green. Yeah. But these encampments were not at, there for, in the public. They're kind of hidden behind. Internal to the, a little more internal to the campus. Yeah, yeah. Um, and what I observed was totally nonviolent, totally peaceful, and I observed a lot of community support. Older people there who were bringing in food because these these young people were determined to stay there. So they needed food, they needed water, and people from the community were there to support them. That was not as true, I don't think, in the 60s. I don't know if that's correct or not. We'll find that out as time goes on. But These, these are people that would come and help them. They weren't actually in the part of the encampment themselves. No, they, no. I think those are the, I think, I'm saying this is my opinion, I think that when the more conservative news deems certain people outside agitators, that's maybe who they mean, people like me. I was up there to support, I wanted to observe what was going on because sure. I'm an attorney and, I, I figure, and I've represented protesters before, so I wanted to see firsthand what was going on. I think when people talk about outside agitators, that might mean me, people like me. I'm a member of this community. I was there to observe and I was there to make an accurate assessment of the situation, but I'm not a student. No, obviously. but I think that's even different than an agitator. You're there I to wasn't agitating somebody. anybody. You weren't trying to organize no, the event no. in any way and or I direct it. You were just helping. No one there in that, that met that definition. No one. Okay. That's what I observed. Okay. The other thing I observed was well, that. I think the, you said, the, well, we, is Wafik a student? It, he was there as well to is do he a that. Student? No, he'd been a student, obviously. One now. Wafik is a Palestinian. Uh, American, he's a citizen of this country, who grew up in a refugee camp because his family was kicked out of Palestine. He grew up in a refugee camp in Lebanon. He has first-hand knowledge of the situation. He reads the Arabic press. He has family that still are in camps in Lebanon, and they're Palestinians. So he was there, too, to observe, to report, and to offer moral support. Is he an, is he, he's not an organizer of the event? No, of then. no, it was a student organized. Okay, just that room Absolutely true. But he has kind of uh, the status of being a, le a leading Palestinian figure in this state and this community. And he was actually able to reach the mayor on the phone, oh, yeah. you mentioned which that, I yeah. thought was really, really interesting. I can't even do that. No, I can't either. I wish I could. I wish I could. I'd love to talk to her about some of these yeah, things, but I, I can't right now. Anyway, that's a whole other interesting story, but that is what I observed. Okay. The other Just one last question. How, yeah. how big do you think the camp is? How many people are involved? 
rough. 100, 200 in the encampment itself, but yeah. there are people surrounding it that they aren't, were supporting. There's people that are there that are staying there permanently. They're in yes. some kind of a tent yes. or a shelter. Yes. And then there's people just walking through or standing yes. around. Right. Now, the other thing. Are staying there. Right. But there are two other things that I observed. One, the place was surrounded by the police. Surround, the police or camp, no, camp no, camp no, camp. the campus police. And I actually heard what they were telling the students. I was there to hear it. I stood Tell in us. the back. Tell us. I stood in the back. It was clear that the campus police, our chief, the chief of the campus police, is Michael Sherling. Not the Michael Sherling. Yes, the Michael Sherling. I thought Sherling. he was still with the state police. No. No, he was there as head of the campus security force. Oh, I didn't know okay, that. Okay, and there was numbers of, there weren't that many police. There were maybe like five. They don't have a huge force. No. The interesting thing if you, um, uh, that I learned is that, and they, then again, I suppose you could call it hearsay because it was. Say it. Okay, but I'm going to say it, anyway. and you object if it's inadmissible, <laughs> okay? However, what was I was told was that the mayor was called, our new mayor, um, Emma Mulvaney Stanek, who has a family with a long history of anti-war activity, by the way. Her father is an environmental lawyer that I've known for years, well. Ed Stanek, and I don't know her mother as well, but I know that they are uh, have anti-war roots. I, I heard yesterday, hearsay, that Emma... Mulvaney Sanek, our new mayor, was not going to send in the city police. That might change. Yeah, but that wouldn't be surprising either. No. A, be given, in campus, and you're telling me it's not even visible from the road. Right. It's an internal campus. It's and a, if they she, feel they can't handle it, you never know, but yeah. they should be able to deal with this. Yeah, they should be able to deal with it, and and that's an important decision. Yeah. I don't think it's a permanent decision, but it means that Emma Stanek is giving over jurisdiction to the campus police. Well, I think, that's, I think they sort of have that. If something were to happen, let's say it did escalate and somebody was shot, injured, or whatever, maybe the Burlington police would have to become oh, involved. Oh, yeah. But I think the campus police, they have a, their separate jurisdiction. They have, yes. I think, most of the powers of the police on that campus, and they should deal with it. Yes. And unless I things guess. get completely wild, leave us out. Yeah, I mean, they, what I, yes, I totally, uh, legally I agree with her and what the situation was. Shirling was saying to the, to the lead, okay, so this yeah, is totally, saying, what? I'm, Tell us what Shirling was Okay, so Shirling was there. Um, I was wondering if he was armed, but I couldn't tell. He's always armed. Is he? I don't well, know. Well, you I, know that. I I mean, I did see once he, he came. He would be when he, I think when he was chief, if I remember him, he always had, you know, they. Yeah, I had the uniform him come. a sidearm. I mean, when he was the chief of the Burlington Police, I had him come to Burlington College once, and he was armed when he came. Yeah, I think that's standard. That's the uniform. Yeah, but anyway, so. I listened to him, and he was there with a representative, I believe, from the university. Because remember, this is a, this is against the university administration. Sure. Okay, so she she looked like a very important person, and they were telling the students, "You get out of here by dark, or we are going to come in and remove your tents." That's what he said. But this was yesterday. No, Sunday. They didn't do it though. Okay, but that gets ahead of us. Okay. So I, I was there until dark. No, they didn't do it. Now, I don't know why. Yeah. I don't didn't. know why. And Maybe that, it was because they didn't have the force, because they certainly didn't have the numbers. They don't have the transportation, I don't think, either to get these students removed and in jail. What, and what day was this? Sunday. Okay, so we're like, now it's Wednesday. Right. And as far as we know, the campment is still there. The campment is still there as of yesterday because I spoke to some people who were there yesterday just yeah. to figure it out if that was still there, and they would, are. I think you would have probably heard if there had been some kind of forced removal. No, I don't. I, don't. I think you would have heard it. For some reason, I believe, I believe that, that believe. The, this is going to be let go. I mean, if the police enter and do something like the removal of students by force, it could be really dangerous. It could be a Donnybrook, yeah. It, it, and it could be really hurtful to the university, too. So anyway, so this is happening all over the country. The other thing I wanted to tell you that I observed, there have been charges on, uh, particularly on Fox News, which I also watch every night. Uh, I don't. That the, well, uh, well, you should. <laughs> you, that's the other side of the story, Steve. Yeah. And it's, you shouldn't be proud that you don't watch Fox. <laughs> but you anyway, should, you shouldn't be. Anyway, go anyway, ahead. Anyway, so Fox is reporting that 
hour after hour that these protests are anti-Semitic. I just want to comment on that. You didn't see that in this case. Not one bit. Not one bit. Nothing. In fact, when I was there on Sunday, I couldn't uh, even talk to the protesters because they were holding a Seder. I couldn't. And the, this is these kids are also didn't tell Jewish. You what, didn't that tell you something about Fox News and its no, no, no. accuracy? You should from watch. What you, from what I, you let's, saw. let's drop that. You should watch it to know the other side. Period. Okay? Get inoculated. Yeah. Okay. So what I saw. In fact, I wanted to talk to them about what I because I'm a lawyer. Yeah. So I wanted to say to them what I had learned that they might have to get their tents out by sure. by 8 o'clock. I couldn't because— you, you, So you, you really didn't have—you were not able to talk to people up there. No, you know why? Police wouldn't let you, probably. No. They didn't want to talk. No, because they were holding a Seder. Oh, okay. And I was, I was told, do not interrupt the Seder. So now, I didn't. Are you going to go back again? To yes, I, I wanted to go back this afternoon, more. but actually, actually I'm still a lawyer. I have to do that oh, kind of work. If, this, if it continues, we can think there'll be more of this story, and maybe you'll actually get— Yes, even some more inside information. Yes, about it. but anyway, so I am very interested in this. First of all, because my own past from 1968, but also I look at Amy Goodman and I see people that I know on Amy Goodman when she reports from uh, the demonstrations in '68. Some things never change, right? Well, I think these are more serious. I think both were terribly, terribly serious. Yeah. I'll tell you one difference that I think might be happening with the current ones is that this is a worldwide movement. And if you think about it, if you think about it, I believe most of, particularly the black and brown world, supports the Palestinians. I don't they know might. that for sure. They look upon it maybe as a colonial extension yes, they, or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Okay, so that's that for now, I think, unless you have other. No, I think it's good. And that's, that's the way just we hope to do these kind of shows where we've got something to offer. Some of it will be opinion. Some of it will actually be firsthand experience or I want that. firsthand inside information. And yeah. I think the same thing with the story I'll do. It's not just I'm looking at a news clip and commenting. I'm a little more inside of it, just like you, where you went up to the camp. Mm -hmm. And I will got again. Got a sense of it that you wouldn't get just if – I don't know where else you get that. Who else was at the encampment? Maybe CAX has been up there at some point. Yeah, they were there. I don't know if they reported, but they, the, the news was there. The police were there. All the, old, all the people that should be there were there. I'm interested that Mike Sherling is in Burlington. I, th I say I thought He's he was – He's not in Burlington. He's a campus – Chief. Well, I mean, but I thought he was still yeah. with the state. Um, yeah. I don't know if he was ever with the state. You might be right. He was. He was head of public safety. But he for was the also, state. wasn't he, in the Department of Commerce? With uh, he might have done that as a stint. Also, he gets yeah. around. Yeah, he gets around. Okay. Well, go ahead. Okay, now, so that's the first story. We're going to show a clip of another story. Now, I think if you live in Burlington, at least if you're local, you know about it. And the fact that uh, Burlington has had some budget issues. The, new, the old mayor left saying that he thought next fiscal year, which begins June 1st, would have about a $9 million shortfall in its budget. And then recently, after the new mayor took over April 1st, they the did some more The new mayor is Emma Mulvaney, Emma Mulvaney Stanick, Stanick. And her people, I guess it's the same treasure as the old mayor had, didn't change treasures yet, but they reported that there had been some kind of error and the new budget shortfall is going to be at least $13 million dollars. And this is all being dumped on a new mayor who's got to come in, and she has her agenda. She likes things to be different. She likes to see maybe some new initiatives, and all of a sudden she's saddled with a very, very large budget deficit. Um, and just before I talk a little bit about that, I'll say one thing. I've been around the city for a long time, been in lots of meetings, lots of meetings with the old mayor, and now I've been in, I think, just one meeting, one finance board meeting with the new mayor. It's way different. People want to see something different. Watch an I old, do. Watch an old clip do. of a finance board meeting in Burlington and then watch the meeting that was held on Monday night. And whatever talents Emma brings to this, one of them is just running a really good, friendly meeting. She was great. And, again, when I went back and I prepared for this report, I watched some of the other older meetings when the old mayor was in there. And I hate to say it, but you, it's no, just – No, you don't. It's, 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 no, aw you it's don't. awful. He's not – just the, the whole – air of it is so different. So that's one kudos to Emma. But I'm not sure what she's going to be able to do. I hope she gets a lot of her agenda accomplished. But just as someone who can sit with people, run a meeting, and be respectful, listen, be right? respectful she wins hands down. 
after just one meeting even. She's she's great. That That is a talent. She does come from that kind of a background, I guess, yes. trying to organize yeah. and bring people together. She does that. The mayor, old mayor, never had that going for him. Anyway. Wellington's multi-million dollar budget deficit is actually higher than original projections. The Weinberger administration had estimated a nine million shortfall, but it's actually four million more, adding up to a 13 million dollar deficit. Catherine Huntley joins us live in downtown Burlington. Catherine, where will the city find that money? Well, Kiana and Kat, Mayor Emma Mulvaney Stanek is urging the city to find a way to close that budgetary gap without sacrificing key priorities. Our budget must reflect the comprehensive safety needs in our community. Mayor Emma Mulvaney Stanek speaking Thursday about an unexpected larger budget deficit. She says it's due to higher personnel costs and a miscalculation of health care and benefit expenses by the chief administrator's office. Now the administration is looking at departments to find ways to tighten their belts and save money. We can build a budget that is affordable and sustainable while also making sure it reflects our most pressing needs in our city. Some options include leveraging the voter approved three cent public public safety tax increase, doubling the hotel portion of the gross receipts tax from 2% to 4%, and using the leftover ARPA funds. Mulvaney Stanek says layoffs are the last resort. We are committed to the priorities that we have in the city, um, and I want to make sure that we do everything we can possibly do, uh, generating revenue from other creative places before we get to that step and start asking that question. The city is also nearly done with two studies that look at raising certain fees and how to make city government more efficient. Council President Ben Travers says he's not surprised about the bigger budget deficit and is looking forward to solutions. I've been excited for some time and remain excited to uh, learn more about the efficiency study that's been going on right now. I do think that there's a number of efficiencies that can be realized in the way that uh, we do business and, and run and operate our city. And with personnel costs being one of the city's main expenses, I asked the mayor if she planned to continue to rebuild the police department with a number of sworn officers. She says she still remains committed to that plan of getting the department up to the authorized cap of 87 officers. Right now, the department hovers around 68. So here's, here's what's happened, though. We now know that the deficit is 1 point, uh, 13 million, 13 plus, and couple questions. What are we going to do about it? And maybe just so we don't repeat history again and know what we're dealing with is how did it come to this? Why are we why are we sitting here now? And let me talk about the why we're sitting here now for a moment. The the city budget, even before this last uh, 45% increase in next year's deficit, we're talking about next year, not the budget we're in now. Even before that, the city knew that there were fiscal problems looming. And they knew it because they were using money from the federal government, and the federal government gave out billions. For COVID, right? For COVID. Burlington got $27 million over three years or so. Burlington used the money, and I'm not saying they're alone in this, but they used the money as one-time money to fund ongoing programs. They didn't use it for things that we would spend money on and then we'd have them forever. For instance, you didn't build a building with it. You funded a position, some positions within city government with most of the money. And now when that money dries up, you have the positions. You don't have an asset, though. They didn't build, build an asset with it, but you have an expense of positions. You either got to cut them or raise taxes to fund them. And you say, well, well what, are, what are they supposed to do with that money? Vermont faced the same thing at the state level. They got money, probably a lot more than the city got. And they had a choice of using that for I'd say more capital type expenses, ones that have long term effect, or just funding the state police or something like that. And the governor for salaries made, essentially. Salary. Yeah, yeah, the governor right. made a big point. He said, We're not doing that because that's just building in a future tax increase and you don't really have a lot to show for it. So it isn't as if no one ever thought, well, maybe we should do it differently. The city made a big point that we're doing it differently. And now the piper is coming home to be paid because we have positions in government and we don't have money for them. And but, but the other thing with it is you could see that this problem today where that fund dries out, you can see it coming. It isn't as if we knew we were going to have money forever. It isn't no, like, you knew it was coming. You no, talked everyone, about they it. They knew. I think they, they, even, they, they knew, knew, but they didn't do anything about it. They knew when they started using that money two or three years ago that it was going to run out in the future. And you should have been planning for that. Either they shouldn't have grown government that much or they should have really advised the people that we're not – raising your taxes right now, but we're taking on this okay, money so and your taxes are going to be raised because of it. 
They didn't do it that way either. Well, go ahead. Ask your question. Before I, I so they about were, um, if they were guilty, I guess, of what many of the Republicans criticize them, Sorry. criticize the Democrats and the progressives for, which yeah. is to grow government and to. Well, what the De Republicans right. will say, they'll, they'll call yeah. it tax and spend. Yeah, that's this right. This will spend right, right, and right, tax right. because we're spending the money using the federal money, and only later do we come back to people and say, well, now you got to pay, start paying for it or make drastic cuts. Right. And so that's where the table was set. So even without this so-called um, financial glitch, a mathematical error that caused this last increase in the deficit for next year, we already had this coming. You could see it a long time out there. And it should have been no surprise. And I'm watching a meeting of the finance board, oh, back in, I think, December 18th it was, or December 12th, before Christmas. And that's when the mayor first says it's going to be $9 million, the deficit for the next year. And you watch and you, you think about, well, where have you been for three years? We should have been planning for this because that money, you could see it three years out, was going to dry up. They only now, are, and it's happening as we speak, are doing a study of efficiency. In other words, why wasn't that done two years ago, three years ago? Why wasn't the planning for the federal money disappearing? There's not a real reason other than they just didn't do it. I mean, there's not a, there's not a good logical reason not to do it. There's just so, you didn't do it. It wasn't good management to not do it. So will the new mayor be forced to raise taxes? And, of course, she's going to have to anyway for the school. Well, the they school. have a plan. And don't forget, one thing that they did do, they do before the old mayor left, they put on the ballot a three cent increase in the public safety fund. Right. That funds police. I think most people thought that that would be, well, go back a step. That was actually intended. I remember when, I can't remember when, but when they put that in effect years ago, that that tax would exist. The idea was that was to provide extra resources for the police. In this case, it's really not doing that. It's just a switch. They're funding more of the police with a special tax, and then the money from that that they're not spending from general fund, they'll put back into other general fund projects. So it's more of a switcheroo than what the real intent was, which was to see a better police force. And one thing they did, and I can't, I didn't look at the debate on when they did it, but originally back in December, the mayor said, we need five cents. Mm -hmm. We voted for three. And Emma was actually hoping to not even use it. She didn't have to use it. Mm -hmm. Now it's, it's looking a little more desperate that she might have to use it. But one thing I came across as I was looking into this, and this is the thing that I think you look at, you say, how do things happen? How do we get there? Sometimes people just make a mistake. You have systems that are supposed to catch mistakes, but people try their best. Stuff happens, and there's a mistake, and sometimes it doesn't get caught. Other times, people don't actually do the procedures they're supposed to do, and then there's the mistakes. And I think that's a different nature of yeah. a mistake than one where I did my best, and somehow the typewriter put a period where there wasn't supposed to be one and then yeah. I'm off. That's not what happened here. They are supposed to, by their own policies, and these are on their website, the city is supposed to have prepared each month monthly financial reports from every department in the city, both the ones that are funded by the general fund and the ones like Burlington Electric and Wastewater. And, and water. used to be Burlington Telecom. And Telecom. They, yes, and that's I've got that page right here. They're supposed to have those reports, and they're supposed to be used by the mayor and the finance board to evaluate what's going on and used as sort of an early warning system if there's troubles. And they, he didn't. Well, they just don't do that. Maybe way back when they tried to do it, no one can remember when they have done it. And when they and, stopped. And when they stopped. And what it did was, when, when times are good, it didn't matter. If everything's no mistakes are made anywhere, you know, nothing to catch, doesn't matter. But when there's problems, that's one more Check. way to look at this and see, well, what's going on? Someone on the finance board could ask questions. You're looking at these reports. Well, they weren't doing them. Finally, they did one this March. They produced one, and it was for the whole year. It's called a monthly report, but it was actually from June through January of this year. And they gave out something that said was a report. And you look at it, I wouldn't say it's, I called it almost unintelligible, but it's not a good report. It doesn't give you any ability to analyze anything or to compare anything. It's just a, some very general numbers showing that this department is going to meet its budget on expenses, and it's going to be under their budget by a certain amount on revenue, they're guessing. But it's not something where you can look and compare. You can't see, you can't see the spreadsheet and, and see anything. And I think if they were doing those reports way back when, 
even this mistake that happened recently probably would have been picked up. Somebody would have said, well, wait a minute, you got the same number here as in the 225 information. Well, that's, isn't that wrong? And then someone said, oh, yeah, that's right, we forgot something. So the reports have value not only to help the city and the finance board and the mayor understand what's going on, but they also just one more check that everything looks like it's, it's right and it's copacetic. So they're not, they weren't doing that. Maybe they'll start to do it. Whatever they do, it's got to be different than the kind of report. I've got the copy here. She won't be able to see it. But this report is just doesn't even cut it. When I was a public works director, we used to do monthly reports. And they were much different than this, much more detailed. And we're on it all the time. Now, there is some truth to the fact that if your budget starts June 1st and you do your report at the end of June, it's not telling you much. Oh, brother. Okay. Wait a minute. I'm going to get rid of this. Yeah, all right. I didn't know this was yeah. on. Sorry. Sorry. Not me. Sorry. Nope. Oh, right. Okay, so and, we and, should wrap well, this up. Well, yeah, yeah. we will. But anyway, just so you know, we used to do reports. And in the beginning of the fiscal year, they Steve, don't matter say, much. Wait a minute, because I think you should say who you are. You were the public oh, works right. director. Maybe I, did. I was the public works director in City Under who? Year, under Bernie Sanders and other mayors. And Peter? Starting in about 2000, uh, 1982, I think, or 81. And I, so I've done many, many budgets, been through many, many different administrations, when I ran the public works department, I know what we used to do. And you took those monthly reports very seriously. And again, the early ones don't matter so much because that's going to happen in the first month. You don't see a big enough trend. By the time you get into month four or month six, you're really seeing stuff. By the time you're into month seven or eight, you really can see stuff. But, at, but the way the budgets are this year, they knew that even early on that trouble was brewing. Because as I said, the trouble was in the one-time use of that money for ongoing expenses. So they should have been watching this very, very closely. I don't, still don't think they're watching that closely. And I, but she will. You I think? hope she will now. Because yeah. I, I think not only do we have problems that we have to deal with, and it's going to probably mean new taxes, maybe cuts even. OEMA doesn't want to cut anybody. Um, but we've got that problem. But I think 2024, the year we're in now, still has some problems. And I don't think they've really tracked it that well. And, and if they're tracking it, only the treasurer's office seems to know about it. If the department heads don't know what they're looking for, because they're not getting financial information to track it with. Okay. So it's 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 not good. It's an ongoing story. There'll be more to it, and it's a little bit complicated. But I think it just. Well, like, you're going to watch it though, watch right? It. And it's we're all going to watch of, everything. Got good procedures, follow them. And when you don't, it's not a trivial matter. It can turn out to be a, a mess. And it's, we're now we're faced with in a very short amount of time trying to figure out a deficit that actually represents over 10 percent of the city budget. It's a lot of money, and it's a lot of money um, in some very important areas, like fire and police. That's over a third of the budget, so they're, and they're a big part of the problem, and what are you going to do? I don't know. There's something. Okay, so, but it. as you said, it's a continuing story that we, the Voices of Vermont, are going to cover. We'll be on it. We'll be on it, as well, well as it. the student encampments and other stories, correct? Correct. Okay, I guess. And maybe not just us, but we're hoping our we're local hoping Burlington to, News right. cooperative get, will grow right. into a bigger organization, and other people, including us, will be sitting at this table giving you some insight and things you maybe you wouldn't get from regular media and even some of the opinions you wouldn't get from regular media. All right, but let's end on the note of May Day today, May 1st. Your favorite day. My One of my favorite days. Okay, is May Day, and I want to mention that later on in the afternoon I will be doing a, a history of May Day, um, and we will be also broadcasting it from here, this studio where we are, CCTV. Will it be part of this, added to this podcast? I don't, I, it's up to you okay. guys. You, I want to thank the producers of this Voices of Vermont, who's Steve Goodkind and Eric Agnero, and the Voices of Vermont is also sponsored by the Vermont Institute of Civic and international Vicky. involvement, Vicki. Um, and I do want to say that May Day is a labor holiday throughout the world, recognizing the huge contributions of the working class people of this country and the world, which has built this world in Correct. the first place. We built this city. And, and, there, and uh, May Day was the honored because of events which happened here in Chicago in about 1868, where workers were on strike, and they were on strike to get the eight-hour workday. We all must remember that workers gave us the weekend, and it was, it was as a result of big strikes. So I will be doing a more thorough commentary on May Day, which originated here 
It's not celebrated that much here, but it originated in this country a long time ago. Nice. So let's honor the working class today. And also honor the working class, particularly in California, who's celebrating May Day by uh, collaborating with uh, those people who are also protesting the war in Gaza. Okay, okay so we will uh, be back this afternoon and back probably here about a month from now. And my phone will be shut off. <laughs> Yes. I can assure you of that. All right. So thank you, Steve. <laughs> thank you, Sandy. Thanks to Eric and Steve and all others.